Shalom everyone, this is Yalak again, and it is August 16, 2017. I have another lesson for you in the New Testament is Fake series, and uh, this one is going to be very dangerous for the people who believe in this New Testament made up by the Romans, who believe in the name of the 2000 year old messiah whether you're a christian or in any one of the other beliefs out there that deal with the name of this messiah and that's what the lesson is going to be about so this is entitled my name i'm wondering though just a thought i had today if we say that the bible is saying that elijah is going to come from the book of Malachi. Let me read it here. From Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Most High. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, if you believe Elijah will return, how will you know when he returns? And see, I'm saying this because of the things I'm about to share in another lesson in this New Testament is fake series. Because no matter how well you have been taught by skillful people who have studied even the Hebrew, and know the Old Testament very well with even its cultures and its lands and the different peoples that live. No matter how well you have been taught by such a person about this faith in this 2,000 year old Mashiach, whether you call him by an English name or a Hebrew name, you have to do something about your mind in order to come to a different understanding, to see things a different way in order to see that you should not be trusting in this Messiah. Because your teachings so far have let you believe in him, and when you hear something different, you struggle with it. Because I've been taught all my life, and now in this Hebrew walk, that Yahweh Shah, Yahweh Shah, Yahweh Shah, Yasha, Yeshua. But you got to change your mind. Listen now, if Elijah is going to return, when he gets here, how are you going to know? You see, you are magical in your mind. Oh, Elijah's going to come. Elijah's going to return. Elijah, Elijah. But if Elijah shows up, let's say he comes next year, you're having lunch somewhere and he's in the food court. How are you going to know? You think he's going to come wearing some Hebrew garments? Standing right in America? Is he going to have a long beard so you can tell this is probably Elijah? Or is it because he's going to call on some fire in the middle of the food court? Maybe you think he's going to just walk up to you and just say, Hey, I am Elijah. See, it doesn't seem to me that the prophets of the Old Testament just walked up to, to everybody in Israel all the time and, and walked up to the scribes and everybody and just told them, Hey, I'm Isaiah. Hey, I'm Jeremiah. Hey, I'm Amos. And just identified themselves like that. These are people who, they just grew up there. And as they grew, they learned and it was known who they were according to how they functioned and how they were trained and so on. So you would know a priest because he, he grew up as a priest. And he was trained in that way and so on. And then he was anointed and so on before the people. You knew a king because that king was anointed publicly and so on. How are you going to know Elijah when he comes? Who's going to, is he going to be anointed in the food court or on the streets downtown in your city? Who is going to tell you that this is Elijah? Who's going to call him out and publicize him, be his marketing agent to let the world know that Elijah is now here? So if you're going to know Elijah, you can't know him because you just look upon him and know him. 
because the pictures that you saw in your Bibles when you were a child growing up, and they still have them in some Bibles today, those pictures aren't pictures of Elijah. Because they're all white, and the children of Israel were black. So those aren't pictures of Elijah. The next thing is, if they had made the picture black, would he look like that? Just like that, so you can say if you see him, because that person never saw him, I never saw him, and you never saw him when he was alive. So you and I can't look to say, based on how he looks, this is Elijah. If that is the case, then Elijah has to be identified in a different manner. He has to be identified with the mind. By looking at what is spoken of his return, what he's going to do, and then you identify eventually based on the work where he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers and so on. When you see that happening and that takes time, then you can say this is. Now, if David is going to return and he's going to rule, you think he's just going to touch down and the same day he touched down, he just says, I'm David and he's now king. How are you going to crown anybody king right now from your own nation? So David would have to be identified in time as he does stuff, stuff, stuff until he is set up as king. That's the way I look at it. And when he rises to the top and dominates his enemies, then you know, because this isn't like the old days where the nation of Israel is already set up and the Mosai has a Samuel waiting there to say, anoint this one, and it's just clear who will be the next king. So the mind will have to get to the place where the Israelite today in captivity has to look at stuff and be strategic about how to move toward truth in order to identify what is going on. And when you approach this whole fairy tale Jesus stuff, you understand that when the mind is working properly, there is no basis, no ground upon which this whole belief in Jesus can properly stand. Now let's run over to Isaiah 29, 23, because I'm going to show you something here about this name, Jesus, how it cannot be the name given by the Most High. It has no power of salvation in it and belongs to someone the Most High did not send to give you salvation, to return you unto his covenant and to restore you from your captivity, and so on. Isaiah 29, verse 23. But when he seeth his children, the work of mine hands, in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name, and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, and shall fear the Most High of Israel. So now, the Most High is here speaking. This is in the time of Isaiah. So if he's saying they're going to sanctify his name, every Israelite at the time knew that this name being sanctified was a name that was already available to them. A name that was at work already and had given them salvation from their enemies and so on. And had given them blessings and set them above other nations and made them a set-apart group of people. So they would not interpret or understand this prophecy from Isaiah as he spoke for the Most High to mean a future name that belongs to some so-called son of the creator that lived up in heaven whereas men live normally on earth. So the name in the prophecy that is spoken of as being sanctified is a name associated with Jacob and was a name that was local at the time. And the name Jesus or Yahawashai or Yahushua was not local at the time as a name that Israel was worshipping. So the name being sanctified in prophecy is not Jesus or Yahawashai. Bam! Let's run over now to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9 to 10. But hear what Paul is saying now to the Philippians and hear what the FT, which I call the fairy tale, Roman Testament is making people believe. 
Philippians 2, 9 and 10, Wherefore God, hath, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Now, every name means that he has given him a name even higher than himself, than God. So God has given his son a name higher than the Father, higher than the Creator. Because it has to be so great that it can save everybody, both Hebrews and heathen. This name is the highest name to the point where all power is given unto the one that bears this name because Jesus said all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. He doesn't leave any power for the Father. But the smartness of your teacher will say that means he's sharing in or has access to all of the power of God. But then the New Testament leaves very, very shady areas which is why they can teach such trickery. But by the time I get through, you will see how this whole teaching of belief in Jesus from the FT, the fairy testament, has been damaged. This name, Jesus or Yahweh Shai, has been damaged by the Mosai himself through the prophets and the writings in the scriptures. So he has given him a name which is above every name, even though the Most High just said in Isaiah 29 verse 23 that he's going to sanctify his name that was known to the children of Israel at that time. And we use different names. Some say Yah, some say Yahweh, some say Haya, uh, Ahaya, some say Jah, still using Jehovah. And there's different kinds of names that you'll find out there. But he, whatever that name is, he is saying here in Philippians 2.9 that his name for Jesus is greater than the name of the Most High that Israel knew. So let's use Yahweh now because Yahweh seems to be more common among us. Um, you know, and it's actually written there when you go into the Hebrew and so on. Now, I don't think that that's the name that Yahweh is his name. So I'm going to have to do a lesson on that. I don't think that. And don't worry, I'm not going to tell you his name is Ahaya either or Ahaya. I thought that at one time as well too, right? So I'm going to do that because like I said, I'm reading the Bible for myself. And now let's look at Isaiah. Okay, no, verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. So what they're doing is they're doing away with the name of the Most High. Because if the Most High is in heaven, they're saying that even the Most High who dwells in heaven, this name Jesus, his name is so great that even the Father's name, Yahweh, is not as great as this. To the point where people will first choose to bow to the name Jesus, the name of the Son, than to bow at the name of Yahweh, the Creator. Let's run over 20, um, Isaiah 26 and verse 13. O Most High, our power, other lords beside thee had dominion over us, but by thee only will we make, will we make mention of thy name. So you see the poem now with this Paul in the book of Philippians from the FT Testament of the Romans is that somehow God has given his son Jesus a name that is higher than every name even than himself yet the Israelites who knew no Jesus in this time of Isaiah and who knew no son of God that died for their sins and so on and knew no son of God who suffered on a cross for their sins or who was prophesied to suffer on a cross because they were not looking for this son of God to die on a cross one day for them. Israel was not looking for that. So the Israelites are here telling you way back then before the New Testament came around that by thee only will we make mention of thy name. So they're saying, we don't have business with other names of other gods because they were commanded to, and, and they went into punishments for trying to call on the other names at other times. So they knew and expressed here, only will we make mention of thy name, the name of the God of Israel that Isaiah prophesied about. And surely Isaiah didn't know Jesus. 
So when Israelites are telling you here that they will make mention only of the name of the Most High, like I said, we use Yahweh for this lesson, they're telling you that the name that is so great and is their salvation and so on, and that precepts bear with and so on, is that name that they had at that time, that they will make mention only of that name. So how is it that they're going to switch later on when the Romans take over and printed up a fairy testament and switch to another name that is greater than? Israelites in the time of Isaiah, when all of us will say Israel would, were doing, was doing better, even though they still have some trouble with transgressions and so on, but still at least their empire was up and running. Israelites back then at that time were confessing there's only one name that we should make mention of. But then Israelites in the time of the Romans are going to switch and say we will make mention of another name that is greater than the name of the Most High that our forefathers were calling on. There is now a name in this Roman Empire that is greater than the name that was in the Israelite Empire before Israel fell to the Romans. There is now a name in this Roman Empire that is greater than the name that was in the Israelite Empire before Israel fell to the Romans. Does that make any sense to you? Does that sound like good Bible to you? Does that sound like good Torah to you? Does that sound like good prophecies to you? from Isaiah and the other prophets, prophets. No. So the name Jesus should not be called because the Israelites were telling you how they did it. No mention of any other God's names. So nobody should have been switching over to Jesus in the fairy testament. Romans chapter 14 and verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Most High, Every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So, I mean, we just don't understand why the New Testament is going back and forth, back and forth. They're trying to tell you you should bow to Jesus. Now they're saying to bow to God. You see that? Because the New Testament specializes in confusing things. Because the way that the New Testament teachers do it, from way back then, all throughout the Dark Ages and whatever, and coming up to now, is the same way they, they keep doing it, is they will just go into a text and they don't gather all different kinds of verses or precepts and different kinds of understandings to let them blend together. They they see a certain so-called truth expressed in a couple of verses in a chapter that they're reading and they teach that and they teach it strongly. And then the next time on another Sunday, they teach something else from a different verse. Where, whereas it seems to me that you should more be linking together different precepts to see how the truth runs throughout the scriptures. So, when they were reading from Philippians 2, 9-10, it seems like you should bow only to the name of Jesus. And now when you are reading Romans 14, 11, it seems that every tongue should confess to God, but Philippians 2, 9-10 was telling you, you should be confessing to Jesus' name. Now you're supposed to find God's name and confess to him with your tongue in Romans 14, 11. Like Paul is just, it is silly. When the prophets are telling you the way that Israel lived, we will make mention of no other name. Let's go now to Exodus. we got a lot of scriptures for you today. Exodus 23 and verse 13. As I continue to damage this fairy tale of this 2000 year old Mashiach. Exodus 23, 13. And in all things that I have said unto you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods. Just like I just read to you already in Isaiah 26, 13 and Isaiah 29, 23, we're going to mention only the Most High. And here it is again, the scriptures are telling you the same thing is consistent in Torah. Be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods. How come Israelites switched to mentioning the name of another god called Jesus or Yahweh in the time of the Romans? in the first century. How come? Then if they did that, then they were disobedient and they were in transgression. That means you should not be following upon their transgression today in 2017 or 25 years ago when you started your camp or 15 years ago when you started your camp. You should not be doing that. You are in the same transgression that they had in the time of the Romans. But make no mention of the name of other gods, neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. Acts chapter 2, verse 21. 
And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So they're saying that, that means the name of Jesus, right? Because I was in church for a lot, of ta a lot of years from as a child. I know that means they're saying the name of Jesus. And you're going to be saved if you call on that name. And verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So again, he's, he's linking the name of Jesus to salvation. Run over to Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. This was a common one of mine as well when I was in the Christian church because I thought these were bad, bad scriptures. Now I know it's all wrong. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But that is a lie because there was another name given whereby people were supposed to Except, um, expect salvation and look toward for salvation, right? In the so-called Old Testament, it was the name of the Most High. Like I said, we're using Yahweh for this lesson. On. So there was another name given way back then that Israelites called on. So why is it that in the New Testament, he's saying there is no other name under heaven given? That is a lie. And it's like we can't see that. They say, if you really want to hide something from someone, put it right in front of their face. And so they're telling you right in front of your face right here, there's no other name given under heaven. Where under heaven, a name was given in the Old Testament that Israelites cried out unto. They had salvation back there. So at least they could have said to you, this is the next name and the only other name given under heaven which is the name of his son. They could have said something like that. But because of the spectacular display of the speaking in tongues and whatever from the day of Pentecost, this is all hot and fresh and whatever, you, you are distracted by all of that Holy Spirit outpouring and Holy Ghost and fire and cloven tongues and so on. So you're not going to question and see things properly, even though it's just right in front of your eyes, that he's actually saying there is no other name given when a name was given in the Old Testament. A name was given a long time ago. So this is a very big lie from the fairy tale testament written by the romans to deceive the children of israel so anybody teaching you to worship jesus or yahweh to call on him or believe in him and so on and that he's your passover lamb and all that kind of stuff very very big lie you should not have anything to do with the jesus in any way colossians chapter 3 verse 17 as i continue to expertly smash this Jesus teaching and Jesus belief of this 2,000 year old Mashiach supposedly prophesied by Daniel. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So that means give thanks unto God through a newer name, a newer name, a newer name, Jesus, which is a name that is supposedly greater than the Father's own name, Give thanks using a new name, even though the most I said, do not make mention of other names, do not it even be coming out of your mouth. And the way I look at it, when it says that to me, although I haven't gotten to that part because I said I'm rereading the Bible. So when I get to that part, I'll study more, but just on the fly, what that means to me is don't make mention like to worship or so for other reasons. But if you're teaching, if you're mentioning that name when you're teaching, that's the way I'm looking at it now until I get to that point where I'm going to study it. Because... When I see the prophets mentioning the name of Moloch and so on, that means they're obviously mentioning a name, but they're doing it for the purpose of teaching. It, you would understand it would be a little bit difficult to talk about all the many, many thousands of gods in the world if you're not saying these gods, because some people are going to get confused. They don't know what you're talking about. You want somebody to know you're talking about Jesus then. So when you see like Moloch in the Bible and so on, they're mentioning the names of prophets. It's coming out of the names, but they weren't in transgression, as far as I can tell, because they were doing it for the purpose of teaching through prophecy. They were teaching, but they weren't mentioning that name because they were worshipping that God. That would have been the wrong part. That's the way I'm seeing it now. So anyway, let's, let's move on here. Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 6 to 15. If thy brother, thy son of thy mother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, so very, very close people to you as well, which is as thine own soul entice thee, so very close to you now, no matter who they are, very close, as thine own soul, 
entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers. Which means that when the Israelites were enticed by disciples in the time of the Romans to believe in Jesus, and they enticed you, the Israelite, because they said some fire came down like cloven tongues and sat on their heads, and you must now believe in this Jesus and call on his name for salvation and be baptized in his name and love his name and worship his name and use his name to heal sick and cast out demons. When the Israelites did that, on the day of Pentecost and after, the Israelites were in transgression because it says, if they secretly entice you to serve other gods which thou hast not known nor thy fathers, even if you want to say Jesus Christ is true, this 2,000-year-old Mashiach, you cannot prove that Moses knew him, that Jeremiah knew him, that Amos and Obadiah knew him, or that Elijah knew him. Therefore, Jesus, the 2,000-year-old Mashiach, Yeshua, or Yahushua, or Yahawashai, fits into the category right here of the latter part of verse 6 that says, Which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers. Hello. So it don't matter how much he seems like he's of God, or from God, or with God, or coming out of God. If your fathers never knew him, and if you, thou, you did not know him, the Israelite he's talking to don't have anything to do with him, even if he tells you, I am the son of your God. Verse 7, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. That means as far as you can go, no matter which nation is doing it and worshiping this God or made it up or whatever, don't have anything to do with this God. Verse 8, thou shalt not consent unto him. So he might be very close to you, even one that is as close as your soul. Even your wife, it says, the woman in your bosom. Don't matter who it is. Your mother could have taught you about this God. Don't have anything to do with this God. Thou shalt not consent unto him. He might tell you cloven tongues like as a fire satan. Don't consent unto him. He might have said, but I am Peter though. I walked on the water when the master told me to walk on the water when it was storming and I was sinking. And he said, come unto me, Peter. He said, don't consent unto him, which means then don't consent unto Peter. He might say, oh, but I'm Paul, but I met the Lord Jesus myself personally on the road to Damascus. He says, don't consent unto him. Do not consent unto Paul. Do not consent unto any one of those disciples that said they followed him. Nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him. So when they're burning John, it's supposedly in oil, in Isle of Patmos or whatever they did, if they burned him or not, I can't remember the story. Do not pity him. Let him burn and fry. Neither shall thine eye pity him. Neither shalt thou spear, neither shalt thou conceal him. Don't conceal now, so you're going to make a big to-do about this, a big deal over this thing, right? Because you're going to blow this out into the open, right? Because you want everybody to know that this person here is calling upon another God in the land of Israel. Especially in Jerusalem where the Most High placed his name. You're going to blurt this out, you're going to let everybody know. But thou shalt surely do what? Kill him. So you see, the Israelites were doing the right thing, right? When they were saying, crucify him, crucify him to crucify Jesus. Yeah, that's what you should do. He says, thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death. So other Israelites should have been killing Peter and Paul and John and all those other Israelites that were followers of Jesus and teaching you after Pentecost to call on him. Other Israelites should have killed him because they did not kill these disciples turned apostles that were pushing Jesus and Jesus' name and Jesus' name baptism because they would not follow the commandments in Torah in the book of Deuteronomy, the book of the law that the Israel's got, Israelites got, then for their transgressions of not putting these disciples turned apostles to death, the Most High sent judgment upon them and the Romans slaughtered them in AD 70. That's another reason why they were slaughtered because too many transgressions they're not following the commandment of the Most High.
Thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first means hurry to do, be quick, a quick resolve. You're not changing your mind, wanting we need this guy sitting in jail, you know, um, for two years while we try to decide the case and wait for the right lawyers and whatever. Kill him. Put him to death. Be first to put him to death and afterwards the hand of all the people. So you're going to be first to put him to death and afterwards the hand of all the people, which means the most are saying everybody should be joining him. Be first, hurry up and do it quickly. And everybody jump in. Don't wait for no nice luck. We've got to go to court for five years. To try to see if this man is guilty or not. Or if he has some loophole in Torah where he can slip through and still save his life. Forget that. Kill him. And all the people. Not just the ones who are concerned with teaching the law and whatever. All the people. Why all? So that everybody in the land will know that this is what should happen to people who try to teach you to worship any other god or call on other names that Israelites did not know that thou nor thy fathers knew. You never heard Moses call out Yahweh Shai or Yeshua or Yahushua. So kill him. Verse 10. And thou shalt stone him with stones that he die. Because he has sought to thrust thee away from the Most High, thy power, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. These twelve disciples in the fairy testament were seeking to turn you away from the Most High. That's what they were doing. Verse 11, And all Israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. So it was wickedness that the twelve apostles were doing with Jesus. Jesus was wicked and the 12 apostles teaching you to worship and follow him were also wicked, says the Torah of the Most High. So how come the Most High sent his son, but his son is raising up wickedness in Israel? In Jerusalem where he placed his name, his son is raising up wickedness by setting up his own name and saying that it is greater than his father's name? That sounds like David's son coming and trying to take him over. David have to flee from his own son, taking over his kingdom and all that. The Moses said, this is wickedness. You're trying to take over my kingdom, the place where I set my name. Now you're converting Israelites against me. So the Moses is telling you here that Jesus is not a God of love like they're telling you in the Christian church. And Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells you so. The Bible tells you so, but God doesn't read the Bible. But he says Something different. He said it is wicked in his Torah. He said it is wickedness. If thou shalt hear, say in one of thy cities which the Most High thy power hath given thee to dwell there, saying, Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of the city of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known again he's telling you not known not known not known in scripture because the Mosa is letting you know that new gods or newness is associated with this type of transgression because the oldness of what you should be following has to do with me my name but if a new name comes up whether it's Jesus or something else it is a transgression and that kind of transgression, as he's pointing out here, would be even from one that is close to you, as close as your own soul, or of the children of Belial. So he's saying it can come from anywhere, no matter where it comes from, as long as this teaching comes up to tell you to worship Yahweh Shai, a black Jesus or anything, that teacher is wicked, is wicked unto his people. They might gather a lot of converts like on the day of Pentecost, the 3,000 souls baptized and whatever, but they are wicked. Wicked 3,000 times and over. There are many churches right now, but they are wicked. Many Hebrew camps right now, but they are wicked. Finest Hebrew garments, but they are wicked. The longest beards, but they are wicked. Wicked, wicked, wicked. The Torah says that. There's wickedness in Israel still. You think wickedness is just like picking up a knife and stabbing somebody because you're in a fight with them who didn't do you anything and whatever. Just simply teaching people to worship this Roman God is wicked. And you paint or print him black and you think that will lower down the wickedness. But verse 14 says, Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently like you're strategic about this now 
like you're some war general, you're going to get this thing done, right? And you're strategizing properly. So, and as diligently, and behold, if it be truth and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, that such abomination is wrought in your camp, that such abomination is wrought in Israel, that such abomination is wrought in the land of your captivity, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword. Now, now of course, we can't do that now because times have changed and whatever, blah, 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 and we're not in our own kingdom or whatever, right? But this is what was commanded when we were set up. And in the future, when the power comes, nobody will get away from this. Because we're going to be judged in the wilderness anyway. But he's telling you at least how serious you should take it. With the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly. The city should be destroyed utterly. Not just the teacher. The city, wipe them all out. Destroy them utterly and all that is therein and the cattle thereof. They're not even worthy to breathe because they're contaminated with the abomination of false God teachings. False God's teachings that Jesus or whoever rests is an abomination that contaminates even your cattle, your animals before the Most High. And the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. Yet you're telling me the Most High sent this son. Let's look over now at Deuteronomy chapter 14, one chapter over in verse 24. Because Jesus here is talking about, or Paul is talking about, uh, the name of Jesus, so great, greater than the Father's name, and every knee should bow unto this name, and so on. But the name, he, they're trying to link in the fairy testament, link the name to a man, Jesus, who says he's the Son of God. But the Most High is linking his name to a city, and that never changed, and jumping out of a city, Jerusalem, into the body of a so-called Son of God, a demigod. It never changed. So it says here now, And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Most High thy power shall choose to set his name there, when the Most High thy power hath blessed thee. Right? There. He's talking about Jerusalem, as you're going to see. Now, if he already made Jesus as the first spirit in creation, if he already made Jesus to bear his name and has given him a name above every name, why is he going to set his name someplace else? So that Israelites have affinity toward a place that has the name because it has the name on it. Shouldn't they more be cleaving to the person of the name, Jesus? But instead he ties the Israelites' heart to the land because the name is placed upon the land. And why? Because the Mosa is going to walk in the land because he is the one who you should love and your heart should be set toward him. While he walks in the land among you. He says I will walk there among you. In the land that I promised to your forefathers. So the name is tied to the land. Because the Mosai is going to be walking in the land. Among us or living among us. But you are trying to tie the name. To the inside the body of Jesus. So that when you look at Jesus. You just love him, love him, love him. Waiting for his return. Because the fairy testament tells you so. That is not according to the Torah. Second Chronicles, chapter 6 and verse 6. But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. Not that I have chosen my son that my name might be there in his heart, and so it should be in your heart also to call upon his name, my son's name that I have given, that is above every other name, including above mine. No, he said, I have chosen Jerusalem that my name is tied not to my so-called son, but tied to this place, Jerusalem. The name is tied to a place, a place, that my name might be there and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. David, 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 not Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. As the fairy testament says, David I have chosen. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 5. But unto the place which the most high your power shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name. See that? He doesn't choose Jesus. He doesn't choose out of all the angels, the first angel that was created, Jesus, to put his name in, a name that was greater than all names, like Paul is saying in the fairy tale testament. No. He says he has chosen the place 
and that place is out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. So a choice for where the name goes or what the name is associated with was already made way back when the Israelites were set up in their own kingdom. And you're telling me that the greatest name was set up and chosen when Jesus came in the Roman Empire. That is a complete lie. It is a fairy tale lie. Because Romans wrote a fairy tale book. The fairy tales, right? Because you know you read nursery rhymes and bedtime stories to children to calm them down, to put them to sleep because they might be scared of monsters and so on. And to also read it unknowingly to color your children's minds so that they can be more deceived in life. But we didn't understand that that's what the fairy tales and bedtime stories were doing. So even so, as the world has been cultured to think that they should read certain kinds of fairy tales to children to put them to sleep, not knowing that those are the same things causing them these terrible nightmares anyway, even so, fairy tales were written for adults as well. The Romans wrote their fair share of fairy tales, and this is one of the fairy tales they wrote. It's from Matthew to Revelation. So bedtime stories of fairy tales of Peter Pan and whatever else they have out there is for children but religious fairy tales that are very very big and have armies and so on are for adults and the Romans made one of those these are fairy tales for adults who are concerned with religion it's called the New Testament or the fairy testament published by the Romans so I will choose this place out of all your traps to put my name there. Even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither shalt thou come. So how come you are seeking the name of Jesus? Because you're seeking Jesus and calling on his name. Jesus, 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 Jesus. You're seeking him and wanting to be reunited with Jesus. You want Jesus to come again. When the Moses is saying, it's not Jesus who should come. It's you who should go somewhere. You should go to Jerusalem. You should seek Zion. You should return to Zion. But the New Testament, the fairy book, is telling you that you should have Jesus come to you when the Mosai is saying you should come to Zion. 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse 3. Now Solomon had prayed and so on. This is the response to the prayer, response by the Mosai. And the Mosai said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. Again, if there was Jesus and Jesus is the great intercessor, why are all these people in the Bible before the Romans came along praying to the Mosai? Why did they pray to Jesus, the great intercessor? But it said they prayed to the Most High. He says, I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever. Forever. That means he doesn't switch on now place his name in Jesus, his son, so that you will call on his son. So that you'll remember the name of his son and remember his son. No, what you should remember is Jerusalem and your heart should long for Jerusalem. So I have placed my name there forever and my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Perpetually. Are you, are you starting to see anything yet? Because how are you going to figure out when Elijah gets here if you can't use your mind to figure out when Elijah gets here? You can't find the deception. So how are you going to tell when Jesus is deceiving you? Now, if a man comes next to you and tells you he's Elijah, are you just going to jump up and just believe him? Well, no, of course you're not. But you are seeing him and you're like, no, 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 it's not him. But you never saw Jesus, but you just choose to believe him. Because Romans who were wicked against your people told you about him by giving you a book about him. Ah, oh, Father... Okay, now still in 1 Kings, let's go over to chapter 14 and verse 21. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 40 and 1 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Most High did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. That's where the name is, it's not in Jesus and his mother's name was Naama and Ammonites. See where the name is? It's associated with this certain place, Jerusalem. It's not associated with Jesus. Second Chronicles 33 and verse 7. 
and he set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house. And isn't it? It's funny that Jesus is such a God that there are idols of him worldwide. Worldwide. And that doesn't strike the Israelite who has been taught to believe in Jesus. You feel if you call him by a Hebrew name, it's all right. The mention of him is, and the teaching of him is associated with so many idols, pictures and statues and carvings and photographs. Now you got virtual pictures of him on your computer, your cell phone and your tablet. You can look up Jesus online. And it doesn't strike the Israelite that the Most High, who never gave you an image of himself to tell you how he looks, is not seen. You don't have any picture of him because he doesn't let people have a picture of him. But the, the heathen always used, for the most part, images and of their idols, of their gods. And it doesn't strike you that Jesus has worldwide images and statues and carvings of him. That doesn't bother you intellectually, spiritually, precept-wise? That doesn't, that, that, that doesn't mean anything to you? But maybe a camp means more to you than the truth or than having your own mind. You're just a slave to America, a slave to Babylon, a slave to Egypt, and now a slave to your camp teacher. So he set the carved image in the house, which he had made in the house of the Mosai, of which the Mosai had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. The name is associated with that place. Jerusalem is not associated with this 2,000-year-old Daniel prophesied Mashiach. Ezra, chapter 6 and verse 12. And the most I that hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand the altar and to destroy this house of the most High, which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree. Let it be done with speed. Because the most High put his name there. So they're cursing anyone who would try to destroy this place. So that in the end, it's the Most High who had to take Jerusalem down himself. The Most High had to decree judgment on Jerusalem himself. Because he put his name there so nobody, none of these heathen kings can just destroy it just like that. The Most High had to pronounce judgment upon his people, Zion himself. Isaiah chapter 18. Because the name of the Most High is untouchable. Isaiah 18. And verse 7. In that time shall the present be brought unto the Most High of hosts of a people scattered and peeled, and from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled, to the place of the name of the Most High of hosts, the Mount Zion. Again, associated not with Jesus, but with Zion. Psalm 102. And verse 21. To declare the name of the Most High in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. So again, it sees these different prophets and all these kings and these people in the scriptures don't know anything about the name of Jesus and they are not concerned with praising Jesus Christ, his son. If the son apparently appeared numerous times in the Old Testament, even in the Garden of Eden, appeared to Abraham, appeared to different ones and so on. If the son was always making appearances, how come David and others don't want to worship him? But the praise goes to the Most High, who set up Jerusalem as his chosen spot to place his name and his presence there. Psalm 122 and verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Not they shall prosper that love Jesus. And how are you going to prosper? If there is no other name given under heaven whereby men can be saved but the name of Jesus, and if blessings come only through the name of Jesus because it is the name that is greater above all other names, how are you going to prosper without Jesus' name? Yet this scripture here is saying you will prosper if you love Jerusalem. That means that you can still prosper and get all the blessings of the Mosai that one can get. 
without ever knowing or believing or trusting in our calling on the name of Jesus. You don't have to trust or love Jesus or be saved by him to prosper. This says they shall prosper that love thee, Jerusalem. If you only just love Jerusalem like this and pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you will prosper with the blessings of the Most High and the salvation of the Most High. You don't need Jesus. So it is a lie from the New Testament for anyone to teach that you need Jesus because he died for your sins and he died to restore the two kingdoms, north and south. That is a lie. Talking about the world in New Testament is Jesus. What does that matter? Psalm 137, verse 5 and 6. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. If I prefer not Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. If I prefer not. But if the name of Jesus is greater than all other names, it is greater than the name placed in Jerusalem as well, the name of the Most High. So then... I have a problem then because if I have to choose Jesus how come I'm going to be cursed for choosing him when I choose him over Jerusalem but David who's going to rule over us and who was already the king of Israel already said speaking under inspiration from the Mosa he's already said well I guess they're saying his Psalms cut off from whatever but at least the book of Psalms here, if I do not remember you. So basically, I will be cursed if I do not prefer Jerusalem or the name that is in Jerusalem and all that Jerusalem represents. It represents the Most High's presence and his name and his salvation and his blessings and his prosperity, etc., etc. So if I will be cursed for forgetting all of this. Why am I going to take on Jesus and risk getting cursed like that? So in order to save myself from a curse on the Most High, I have to ditch Jesus, his great and powerful mighty name. So when the Most High is saying, return unto your forefathers, Jeremiah 6, 16, ask and see, you know, in the old past and so on, when you look back in the old past, they're telling you that how the Israelites did it there is to vow to themselves not to forget Jerusalem or they're going to be cursed. Yet you want to take on a new path of walking in the footsteps of Jesus or Yahweh Shai? Then you are not obeying the scriptures in Jeremiah 6.16 6, that says to return to the old path. That means you are teaching lies. See, Jeremiah 6, 16, Thus saith the Most High, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? So the good way has not to do with Jesus. It has to do with the other things I've been reading before, where these kings and prophets and so on are telling you about the Most High only. And walk therein when you find this way. When you look back and you search and you dig and you try to find it, when you find it, walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. And these Jesus teaching camps, they are telling you by teaching you about Yahweh Shai and Yahushua that we will not walk therein. That's exactly what they're doing to you. We will not walk therein. If you wondered what kind of Israelite was there back then, a couple thousand years ago, saying with such audacity, we will not walk therein. You don't have to wonder much longer because they're here in modern clothes now saying we will not walk therein. They're here today in modern times saying over microphones, we will not walk therein. On YouTube and Facebook, we will not walk therein. We will not. That's what the Israelites said way back then. Seems not much has changed. And so we continue to live under a curse. Deuteronomy again. Chapter 26. Verse 2, Thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth, which thou shalt bring of thy land, that the Most High thy power giveth thee, and shalt put it in a basket, and shalt go unto the place which the Most High thy power shall choose to place his name there. Jerusalem is what they're talking about. Because his name is linked to that place. It's not linked to the man Jesus. 
a demigod, black or white, whichever you want to choose. So the name was already set or linked to that place, which is a place of salvation and promise and blessing. So how come Jesus became, becomes now that icon of blessing and promise and salvation? It was already set and it has never changed. Deuteronomy chapter 26, still the same chapter. Let's look at verse 19. And to make thee high above all nations which he hath made in praise and in name and in honor that thou mayest be and hold the people unto the most high thy power as he has spoken. This is what makes us different. Does it make you different to trust in Jesus for your salvation when everybody else out there who loves Jesus is calling and trusting in him? Like a Jesus mania worldwide? One third of the earth calls on Jesus. One third worships him. Now you got new age people worshiping him and, and what, uh, talking about him and teaching him and so on. And you know what? They were always believing in him. They were just hiding it. It was low key. And they used different names for him and so on. Now they're just coming up bold and telling you Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus the great master teacher and so on. Where you might say other words, you might use Lord and Savior Jesus, but they might call him master a great teacher and stuff like that, right? But it's the same person they're talking about. Anyway, so basically that's showing that Paul is a lie. Okay, let's run over now to the curse chapter, Deuteronomy 28 and verse 58, just to make this more dangerous for the Jesus believers and the Hebrew Christians. If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law, so he's not talking about some future beatitudes and so on, and some future teachings, um, that's going to lead up to somebody going and cover. But this law that are written in this book, not the fairy tale book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, not that other name or the name that should come or the other name when I give my son a name that is greater than this name that I'm talking about. But this glorious and fearful name, this means current, present, right now when these things were being spoken a couple thousand years ago. This fearful and glorious name, the most high thy power. Which we're saying is Yahweh for this lesson until I get to that point. And so if you don't do that, then verse 59 is saying that he's going to make your plagues wonderful and so on and blah, blah, blah. I don't need the rest of that. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 3. So now this name means a current name at that time when those Israelites were alive. And he says now, because I will publish the name of the Most High, it means they were going to publish a name that was present at that time. So it was not Jesus' name that's going to be published. So how come New Testament is talking about to spread the name of Jesus for salvation and healing and so on? And you're there spreading it in your camp, opening up another camp location to spread more of the name of Jesus. You are a liar and a deceiver. And you are the wolf in sheep's clothing. That's exactly who you are. You don't pray, you don't teach truth, you don't associate with truth, you just look like you pray, you look like you associate with truth, you look like you teach truth because you have a Bible in your hand. But I already told you, God doesn't read the Bible, we do. He never walked up to Adam with the Bible saying, here you go, you need to know what time it is and what this is all about. Adam never read a Bible himself and was the first man to make contact with the Creator. Don't mess with me. So I will publish the name of the Most High, ascribe ye greatness unto our power. So he's not publishing no Jesus name, a name that is greater than whatever. That is just ridiculous. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 27. Behold, the name of the Most High cometh from far burning with his anger and the burden thereof is heavy his lips are full of indignation and his tongue as a devouring fire does that sound like it's talking about jesus the burning anger and so on and whatever i mean like, like come on come on people is jesus who didn't even want to fight isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8, I am the Most High, that is my name. 
or I guess let me see now I see Jehovah the Tottenabal which I guess you would call Yahweh um, I'm the most high that is my name and my glory will I not give to another so how come Jesus got glorified got the kind of glory that is included in a name given unto him that is above every other name you wouldn't call that being glorified but he says he will not share his glory with anybody else neither my praise with graven images you see the most high is is something else you know because he could have just stopped right there and said i won't give my praise to anybody else but he says neither to graven images as if he knew that one was going to rise up who was going to have many 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 images spread about him and carved and made of him and printed on paper about him worldwide one day and you know him as jesus or whichever Hebrew name you want to use for him. The Most High knew it, so he addressed it near the graven images, and for the other graven images out there as well too, for other gods. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 6. Therefore my people shall know my name, therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. So the Israelite at that time would have understood the name of the Most High, not Jesus. So they're not thinking that in that day people are going to know his name Jesus. Because if he's talking about some future name that would be the name Jesus, then the Israelites at that time would have felt more than slighted because they're the ones who set these foundational things in writing for us to have today. And somehow his name isn't revealed to them, this glorious and mighty name, but we're going to get it. And they had such a tough time trying to stick to the name properly and stick to the Torah properly because they were up and down so much to the point where the Mosai says, in the future, I'm going to redeem you and I will not let you sin against me anymore. But they had such a tough time and they don't deserve to get the name. But we who don't really even know our head from our foot, just finding out where it is right and we're going to just get the name just like that. How can the foundational people not have the name back then in order to write it in scripture for us to learn? So it had to be a name that was written way back then. Not no new name after the prophets died. Because the prophets had to know the name as well and call on the name. Because he shows it, he, is, is, he gives his word to the prophets, right? So how come the prophets would not have known the name if Jesus' name came later on after they died? It's rubbish. The greater name that Jesus got, greater than all names, even greater than the Father, highly exalted kind of name. And the prophets weren't alive to even witness and know that. So the prophets cannot use their own precepts coming from the Mosa and from the other writings before them and the other prophets before them to verify this new name of Jesus that is mighty and powerful. King David never even got to utter and mention this name or even hear it in his own ears. But he was crying out to the name of the Most High so much. Just, I don't know, silly. And you're so scared sitting in all your special camps. You cannot. And you're Christian pastors and you cannot get up and walk out. Because you are in spiritual bondage. That's why. Isaiah chapter 63, verse 14. As a beast goeth down into the valley, the spirit of the Most High hath caused him to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Verse 19. We are thine, thou never bearest rule over them. They were not called by thy name. So how come now all kinds of Gentiles, starting from the Roman Empire, are called by the name of Jesus? Where you've got all kinds of Christian nations out there now that worship Jesus worldwide you even got church of assyria church of this church of whatever church of britain or church of england church of whatever they're all named by jesus name but these scriptures here are saying from the prophet you'd never bear rule over them they were not called by your name so if they're called by jesus in church of england and so on it's got nothing to do with the israelites or the most high but they belong to the congregation of the dead. That's where those churches belong. In their own special congregation. <laughs> Alright, so now. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 3. Verse 17. 
at that time they shall call jerusalem the throne of the most high and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the most high to jerusalem neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart things like calling on jesus imagining and thinking conceptualizing that there is salvation in jesus jeremiah chapter 7 verse 11 in this house which is called by my name become is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes behold i have seen it saith the most high name called by my name so the israelites would have known this was the house of yahweh or the house of the lord you know they would not have known it as the house of jesus a great name that is greater than the name of the father they wouldn't have known it because there was no such teaching that the israelites should worship jesus or yahweh shai you've got all kinds of scriptures here i hope you think of it you need to do what you need to do to break out of the Jesus Yahweh Shai deception.